Welcome to Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. I am Ben Dietrich. Jordan Ridelli is on vacation. And Andrew Quo, because it's Monday and he takes no days off, is here. Andrew, how are you? Motivated, man. Mm. Monday motivation. I'm here. I'm ready. I am ready to fire some tips. Did you rise and or grind? Both at the same time. Same damn time. Oh, you love to see it. It's incredible. It's like every Monday I feel more and more amazing. Do you sometimes rise and not grind? Never. It's always both. Always. Every day. No days off. Yeah, I don't know how people rise and don't immediately start grinding. <laughs> Or like, like it's just it's just completely foreign to the way that I live my life. Like I'm as soon as my eyes are open, I'm working. Yeah, it it doesn't exist without the other. You can't grind and not rise at the same time. It's a self fulfilling prophecy, man. I mean, I've gotten to the point where sometimes I'll grind before I even rise. Wow! Like I'm pre- still in bed sleeping, but furiously cool. grinding. Do you pre-grind? It's like I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna get ahead of this grind so I can rise at the same time. I feel like you got to do your pre-grinding the night before, so mm. that as soon as you rise, the grinding can commence. Mm. I love it. It's like uh, the minute the minute I open my eyes, the grinding has commenced because I'm prepared. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's way too many people who are rising and maybe they grind. I don't know. 20 minutes in, that's 20 minutes ungrinded, just it, sitting there, not grinding. It's so funny watching Twitter, especially after The Last Dance, and everyone's grinding, bro, but they're not rising. It's like, mm. wow, you guys wow. don't have this in sync. Like, Do you even cookies, rise? <laughs> yeah, do you even rise, bro? Um, well, well, look, man, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you are you know, back on your grizzly. <laughs> always I'm always back on my grizzly come on grind um, city baby <laughs> that's what they call my apartment <laughs> so I gotta be totally honest with our audience here finally at long last you know I gave the novel coronavirus COVID-19 a chance gave it a shot man it's not for me. Oh. I've decided I'm over it. Are you ghosting the coronavirus? Are, you know, have you had it. Look, I think we gave it the old college try. We saw the ups and downs, and honestly, I I just don't feel it. Don't like coronavirus. You're talking about the movement that kind of started this week about just being over it and people wanting to open up their shops wanting to go out maybe even people pushing to like open bars and like continue our lives what's up with that i think if we charted a map of behavior if that was a possible thing to do if only sentiment could be mappable spatially analyzed i think it would start with fear people were scared and anxious didn't know what was next and that was the the palpable um, emotional output from everyone in society, people in New York, etc. Then I would say about a week and a half ago, we settled into a sense of doldrums that this was our new life. It was going to be like this forever. Things are just going to suck. And I feel as if over the last few days, we've started bleeding into a new era of COVID behavior which is over it, like enough, enough is enough. And at least that's sort of the vibe I've been picking up here in New York. And I've heard people saying similar things along the West Coast. Certainly there is outcry to open up states from some people, 
and some of those are you know small groups who want to open up gun shops or whatever but overall i think in new york because that's what i can say i'm intimately familiar with i think there's been a little bit of change over the last few days where people are like i think we're done with this well, have you picked up on that and is this is this premature i i'm i know what you mean i mean it, the the hashtag is trending today and I think a lot of it has to do with Thursday being the first. So we're staring at a rent mortgage week for everybody because we didn't get any freeze of any sort with either. So people have to pay their carrying costs, whatever, if you have an apartment, if you rent a, you know, a bedroom. The landlord wants their money, man. And uh, that's really stressful. And you know, like we always say on, on cookies, it's like, I think the reaction here is people want a swing. They want a fighting chance. And that's logical to me. Uh, death is the consequence, and it may not be yours, but like this is a real test of like our humanity a little bit. Like If we do this, then it puts certain people at risk, and how much do we care about our neighbors? I, we'll find out, right? I don't know if it's about rent. I'm sure that is the motivating factor for a lot of people is like, I need to earn money again. Oh my God. That it's, it's 90%. I think. I don't know. I don't know because I think there are those people who are like, well, if we're not going to get any help from the state and we're not going to get help from the government, like get, let's get bars open again, blah, blah, blah. But I think there's also just a general sense of, all right, we're done sheltering in place. I think there is a, a cabin fever has started to set in that, as, as I was describing the sort of arc of, of general sentiment. And there are real factors, as you said, like rent. That's very real. And people being broke. But I'm saying as an overall, just general feeling, it seems to me that that has been hysteria, fear, boredom and sadness, depression, to now, all right, enough. And so, and again, to me, it's less about even working and making money as like to your point we are humans and this is humanity and we're not actually meant to exist like this yeah we're social creatures for sure and um i think you know i, I wonder if if the government somehow magically was like you guys everything's frozen no one has to pay anything for a month we'd have a different reaction be like okay i can do this and if we got the two thousand dollar stimulus but let's take money out of it I think just sorry to interrupt, but for the record, I think you were right. That kind of thing would certainly quell this sort a of little bit. Yeah, uh, this, this idea. I just think it's multi pronged. That's all for sure. And I think the more interesting discussion, maybe the less the less depressing discussion would just be our emotional state and how we deal with this in a self-care way. And I agree. Like, I don't think humans were built for this. Um, I think social media helps so much and to be able to like shout into the night and have somebody shout back on social media is an incredible thing that should not be under understated. But um, I, I do feel everyone has a different breaking point and as a community we kind of do it together because no one wants to be the first, you know, and I think something trending like this was going to happen in week six because the only way to curb this would be to have a constant voice from a position of power telling us what the plan is. And we're not getting that, so we're talking amongst ourselves, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. If there was a higher power that was telling us, we got you guys. You're good to go. Do not worry about your health care. Do not worry about your rent. Do not worry about food. You are taken care of. We are in this together, and once it is safe, you can go back out and go back to your lives. But in the meantime, we got you, man. Yeah. And we don't have that. Yeah. It is very much a sense of, well, man, you are shit out of luck. Yeah. Oh, you don't have food? Fuck off. You can't pay your rent? Yeah, fuck off. And people are like, okay, you're not taking care of us? Well, then let me go out and do my thing. And that's part of what we've seen everywhere is a lack of 
a, a lack of faith in anyone looking out for us, which is based on an absolute reality. Yeah, there has been, I keep on hammering this home in my head. We're in week seven or eight, whatever, wherever you started keeping time. And we still don't have like mass testing per capita. And to see our president kind of figure out what per capita means live on camera is hilarious, <laughs> you know. And we don't have masks. We should just have masks where they give us our, our tests, free tests. Um, here, have a mask. Here, have some gloves. Uh, we don't even have that simple, simple optic. And we have nothing. We have lines for supermarkets and empty shops. And that's all we got. And I walked around on Saturday. Uh, it was a beautiful day in New York on Saturday. No joke. It was 60, sunny. And I chose that day to get my, to get my groceries for the week. And it was jamming, man. <laughs> there were people out. Half of them were wearing masks. And people were definitely aware but, you know, I stumbled across people drinking bottles of wine and eating a stack of pizzas and, like, staring other people down, being like, I dare you to narc us kind of thing. <laughs> and, Love that. Love that energy. Yeah, and these people probably aren't, wouldn't be sick. I am judge a book by its cover, but, like, they don't strike me as New Yorkers. They maybe strike me as, like, you know, people who moved to New York. They're absolutely, they seemed wealthy, just based off of their shoes, <laughs> uh, their Yeezys, you know? And I was just like, yeah, this this seems logical. This seems the way humans uh, should react to things like this. And most of us have to not do that, but if some of us do, we can account for it. I would say this, though. People who live in New York City, even if they have more money, have been cooped up in their apartments. And... You know, if we're talking about some European people, because I've seen a bunch around here, their options were like get on a plane, which no one wants to do, go back to Paris, lockdown, Barcelona, lockdown, yeah. Italy, lockdown. Even if you go there, you're going to spend two weeks in quarantine. So they all stayed here. Just, just saying they are in this cumulatively with the rest of us, Smart. even if they are European invaders, <laughs> Euro stepping around. Quo's six foot radius, but ten foot radius. <laughs> but my Twelve. thing is, people who have been here don't have the luxury of large apartments. They don't have backyards. Most people don't have big patios. They're not in a suburban cul-de-sac where you can wave at a neighbor from two hundred feet away while going on a walk around the block. They're not in the Catskills where you might not see another human as you wander around the woods looking for fiddlehead ferns and whatnot. People space. here don't have a lot of space. And I said this before, I'm not in the mood to hear people say that New Yorkers did a bad job because I think New Yorkers overall have done a fantastic job, far better than expected. The streets are generally pretty much empty. We're talking about 8 million people People have stayed inside. People are social distancing. People are wearing masks. Is it everyone? No. Could people do better? Yes. But overall, we've been asked to do more than anyone else in America and I think have done a good job. And I think it's worth having some like love for that and having some respect for that. So on a nice day, when every single person wants to get out of their house, we don't have a lot of public space. There's nowhere to go. Stores are closed. Bars are closed. Restaurants are closed. Cafes are closed. There's nowhere to go except the park. So every single person has the same idea and they try to go there. There's too many people on the sidewalks. There's too many people in the parks. Yes, yes, it's true. And some people are like, this is shocking. I can't believe this is happening. There are other people who have the exact same idea as me in the same place at the same time that I decided to go here. Let me take a photo and put it up for scolding acclaim. But I get it. People could do better. Absolutely. Absolutely. I also do not like this idea that New Yorkers are oh, refusing to social distance. Look at them. Man, people have been in their apartments. They tried to get out. And yeah, it could have been better. I mean, I think, I mean, I agree. I, I think New Yorkers did what they could, you know? And I think we reached our breaking points 
at different times and we have to forgive ourselves for that maybe you know like this is such a weird thing because the consequence is death <laughs> and so i i have trouble thinking about it but, but I, you were I, out there too you had the same idea to go to the you know to, to go out during that same window of time just like i did and just like every other person in new york and the consequences were wow the streets are uncomfortably crowded the park is uncomfortably crowded uh, you know, like we all did Literally everybody came out of their house at the same time. Yeah, and that's why I think, like, I don't think I'm doing a great job. But, like, there's no answer, right? And, like, so my my whole thing even before this pandemic started was it's very frustrating to see, like, organisms kind of, like, attack itself, sort of like lupus, right? We've been talking about lupus lately because of um, uh, chloroquine. But, like different pockets of Twitter do this and different pockets of cities and then cities overall do this. We bicker amongst ourselves and the bigger picture is like the Senate's not doing anything. Yes. <laughs> like uh, the uh, McConnell's not doing anything. The White House is not doing anything. I'm even mad at Cuomo. Do something. I, you're not going to get help from the Senate. Then we need to figure something out. I don't know. I'm not a politician, but like... Um, I think, you know, when we argue that players make too much money, we're devouring ourselves like lupus. We should be talking about how much money TV contracts make and owners and and the whole ecosystem, not just the things that we can see. Because when we fight with each other on Twitter, and sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's not, sometimes I feel like we're devouring our own immunity and making us more vulnerable and... I don't want to fight about people who want to have pizza. I just want the government to do something. We're on the same page, 100%. My thing is exactly that. Instead of taking up arms against your neighbors who came out for a couple hours over the last like six weeks to try to sit in the park on a nice afternoon where everyone had the same idea, and came to the same conclusion that it was kind of impossible to do because it's too crowded. Like, don't attack people. Don't take photos and put them online and be like, wow, park is, cl is crowded today. Man, you went to Domino Park just like they did. If you don't like it, go home. If you were uncomfortable, go home. Go home. That's what you're suggesting that all these other people should do. You, go home. And like, I get it. I get it. When I walked by a place that had reopened, and I looked inside, there was people sitting around in an outdoor area drinking. And I'm like, it's too crowded in there. I'm not, I'm not comfortable trying to find a place to sit in there. There's not enough room between people. I just went home. I looked over. I saw other people on the sidewalk taking photos. Oh, here you are. What, what's the point? You're going to send them to the cops? Because you <laughs> wish people were a little further apart? You're going to send them to de Blasio? Send a tactical strike force down? You're going to put them up on Twitter so that other people can cluck? and judge New Yorkers collectively. Oh, look at those assholes. They're so selfish. Half these photos that people are bitching about, people are social distancing. They're wearing masks. That was the wild thing about that photo from Domino Park. People were outraged. And then you look at the photo, and you're like, mm, everyone's in groups of ones or two. Everyone is more than six feet apart. Oh, you know, 90%. A couple people should be wearing masks at that you know, distance, but like overall, it was a portrait of a population with an incredibly limited amount of public space, a little bullshit park. It's not even a park. There aren't even trees. Okay. Domino Park is a little sliver of basically like grass and, ast and astroturf along the East River and people just like trying to find a place to sit. So de Blasio's whole, like, if you see something, say something thing is kind of a good strategy because it costs the city zero money and it does turn us against each other. But obviously, and, and they obviously don't even respond to it. No, it's just like, oh, definitely shoot that over to us. And then and then people are like, mm, I've done my civic duty. It's a zero cost thing. It's like, officer, officer, someone stole my purse. Like, we'll be right on that. <laughs> uh, it's a totally. Seinfeld, a lane thing, you know, and I think. De Blasio, when he said that, I was like, oh, that's a decent strategy because it costs the city that sentence. And then that's it because they're not going to increase cops, you know, patrol officers. You're not going to put more people on the streets to police this. It's just like you guys turn against each other and figure this out and it'll 
seem like we're doing something, but you guys are just like snitching on each other, which is a fine strategy for government, you know, um, but we should be aware <laughs> Employed of Employed by the East Germans to incredible effect. I mean, but you see cities like Singapore having a tough time, which was surprising to me, like New Zealand's crushing it. Germany seems to be crushing it. Taipei crushed it. But Singapore didn't. And I think that was interesting because they're the most notorious police state in the world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And while I agree that sort of a cumulative, I keep saying cumulative, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a public shaming to keep people in line is, is kind of the way that we organize a society yeah. without having, you know, it, like cops everywhere. It's... My whole life is based off of peer pressure. I do everything based off of pressure that I sense from my peers, you know? I mean, that's how society works. Yeah. Enough peers think something and then it becomes law. It becomes fashion, law, yeah. uh, art trends, movements, you know, like it just is a part of our social lives. And you uh, have there... to stop shooting mid range jumpers. I won't. <laughs> Yes, okay. right, right. <laughs> yes, you see this in the NBA, right? In like 20 years from now, pe people will be like, I was 15 when I watched The Last Dance, and I did not understand what the big deal was. I'm like, <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> but, I, I, yeah, I just think our enemies are higher up. Your enemy is not the person who is a foot too close while eating a slice of pizza because – Look, when you go down the sidewalk and everyone went outside and people were trying to get beers and pizza and the streets were crowded, it's because there isn't room. If you wanted to get a slice of pizza, you had to stand in that line. And if you had to get a beer, you had to get in that line. And if you wanted to walk by them, you were walking by a long line of people and getting annoyed at them. Yeah. There just is not a space for people to go. So that's why I'm saying be nice to your fellow citizens. If you don't like it and you're not comfortable, just go home. No need to be a scold. No need to be angry and, and feel as if, you know, Amer uh, New Yorkers are, oh, they're selfish. They're out there in the park. Yeah, look at those animals yeah. sitting there by themselves trying to get some sun for the first yeah. time in two weeks. What a, what a dick. And this is the problem. This is the hump. It's the heavy lifting we have to do as humans to not only be safe and pressure our peers to be safe, but also not be dicks. And that is such a fine line for each person that I think that's the main challenge. And when we're trying to do this in week six or seven, it's exhausting. And all I want to do is scream, sleep, or do nothing, you know? And considering we don't have the same strict laws keeping us captive that they have in places like Barcelona or Paris or Milan, I'm just going to say it one more time. I think New Yorkers have done a great job overall and like deserve props for that. They don't deserve hate. They don't deserve to be called assholes for trying to sunbathe for an hour. Like let's let's love our let's love the let's love the community. Yeah. Like address your hatred towards the people who have done nothing for yeah. us, not your neighbor. And this is love the thy fellow man. It's the cookies creed. <laughs> This is like the New York tax, right? We're always, if we want, we want a lot of attention for being progressive and uh, a, a kind of a society in within a society, then we have to deal with like the attention that people put on us now. You know, like this is just a, a, a fabric, the fabric of living here. And, and yeah, like per capita, we have done a good job. And certain neighborhoods do better for different reasons. And there's places like New Orleans who are are also hurting. And I'm willing to take the brunt as a New Yorker being like, you guys fucked up. I'm like, no, I disagree, but whatever. <laughs> like, I, I'm not going to argue about that. You know, like, it. this is just bigger than this argument, I feel like. And But you're right. And um, I think we numbers are down today. I think we're down to 340, which boggles my mind because it's still always, a lot. Yeah, and we always say this: How many of those people were Knicks fans? How many of those people loved Carmelo Anthony? Like this is heartbreaking stuff, man. Yeah, and my general philosophy on this is reminds me of something that friend of the pod Dave Jacoby told me many, 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 many years ago. I forget what we're even discussing. He said, what would, what would the Fonz do? 
I was like, I don't know, man. He's Sounds like, on brand. He's like, he'd be cool. <laughs> Sounds like, very on brand. I was like, I was like, you're right, you're right. He would be cool in this situation. It's true, it's and so that's how that's that's how I think people should be approaching this. That person is too close to the other person. What would the Fonz do? He'd be cool. <laughs> It's funny because coming from Jacoby, that totally makes sense. If I told you that, you'd be like, fuck out of here, dude. <laughs> out of me, it's more like, what's happening? What's going on? Don't do that. I don't know. <laughs> and Jacoby, definitely. that. Yes, Jacoby is 1,000% right. That's all I'm saying. Be cool. Yeah. Just think. Yeah. What would the Fonz do during the COVID era? He'd socially isolate, but he'd also be cool. Yeah, wouldn't, he wouldn't be a pizza. Out. He wouldn't be a pizza shame. Yeah, let's bring down our, our our cop behavior, our law enforcement behavior, a couple notches. We always have to do it because, again, society. But like, <laughs> yo, let's not be Officer Mitchell now. It's over. Like, we're just bracing, and now it's like we're at the point where <laughs> we just gotta take it, man. Yeah, man. And, you know, instead of taking a photo of a slightly overcrowded park where depth perception makes people look a lot closer than they are in case they actually go in and look at the photo <laughs> yeah. for your, I don't know, you know, your virtue signaling scorecard so you can be COVID MVP, instead of doing that, just elbow a jukebox. <laughs> let, let us start playing some tunes. Get that leather on, man. <laughs> Get, get on your motorcycle and get, get yeah. on your motorcycle and go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cuff those jeans. King. <laughs> Cuff those jeans, not your neighbors. <laughs> Start smoking cigarettes. Did the Fon smoke cigarettes? I don't yeah. know if he actually no. did, but like sure. Obviously. He had the he had a pack in his rolled up sleeve, right? Oh I can't tell if that was Pony Boy and the Outsiders or the Fonz, but they're all the same cool guy archetype and they would all be cool. Some West Side Story shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, someone, I was like talking to someone and then in the middle of the conversation, she just screamed like, everyone just chill the fuck out. And I'm like, yes, truer words were never spoken. That's uh, really it. That, that's yeah. just what I'm advocating. Yeah. Cool out. Chill <laughs> out. Just take a step back and think, you know what? These guys did a pretty good job. They could be doing better, but it's a nice day. Let let the people get a little sun. Yeah, it, it's okay. It's okay. They're outside. People are doing their best. Yeah, that's but that's where like my whole rent thing comes in because like be cool, chill out. I'm like fair, but I can't pay rent on Thursday. I'm like ooh, <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> my thing is, do I think there would be a spike in new COVID cases based on people going out to the park? Not that likely. More interaction between like. Buying pizza on the street, buying beers, those things. Yeah, I think that could that could lead to like more cases. Yeah. But I don't think people being in a park is necessarily going to be like a vector in the way that like bars were, or restaurants were, or even a supermarket might be. As long as it's sunny and the the heat kills the Rona, <laughs> exactly. we're okay in a park, man. Yeah. But not in a dark pizza parlor. <laughs> <laughs> in the bowels <laughs> yeah, yeah. of Scar's Pizza. <laughs> for I can't get the light inside my body. <laughs> Science. <laughs> Sarcastic. My bad. You fell for it. <laughs> oh, a deft prank played on the media. <laughs> By the me. president. Again. Again. Oh, the jokester in chief. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It was a prank. It was a it was a it was a hoax that uh you're 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 the fool. <laughs> Jackass. Noble, I meant like distinguished moron. <laughs> You're dumb. <laughs> uh, I'm so it's and it's such a mean. I was thinking like this is Trump's genius, right? Because McConnell is tripping over his million left feet right now, running after whatever he motivates him, and we're obsessed, rightfully, for clowning the 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 president of the United States. And this is his genius. We're just like, okay, so what you said was you meant the Pulitzer, but you said noble as the, an adjective or royalty. And he <laughs> was like, right, idiot. <laughs> and that was like 18 hours of the news cycle. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> Got him again. <laughs> it's like, I'm the fool. 
man. Well, well speaking of conservative hijinks, <laughs> there was what a, else there was a bit of a system? scandal <laughs> where Land O'Lakes, the long-running butter company. <laughs> Can't even say it. Think about it with a straight face. <laughs> the Butterman. Go on. Go the on. Butterman from, from Land O'Lakes. Okay, so the butter controversy, go on. <laughs> <laughs> they decided to take the Native American woman off of their logo, off of their box, and replace it with, I guess, a field or a lake, or however butter is produced from, I guess, cows. But anyway, there's fields and there's lakes and there's she a land. She was removed from the scene. She's absent from the scene. And that sent conservatives into a tizzy. They were not happy about this at all, and it was... It was a real it was a real issue. And I didn't unfortunately stumble across like dirty images that conservatives had made or apparently that's a thing. Hmm? Taking logos that include women and making them into dirty illustrations, making them lewd. I did not know that was a thing, but it is. So I stumbled into photos of the Lando Lakes Native American woman with like enormous breasts. One of my friends came came across that online. One of my friends uh, used to be a tagger in Philly, and he used to just draw snakes with giant boobs on them, which I thought was amazing, but that's neither here nor there. Or maybe it is here and there. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of the same thing. <laughs> so why were conservatives so angry about a butter logo? All right, so I think this is... This is multiple funny, dumb layers, but, you know, like American natives, every uh, every minority goes through their own racist kind of process, trust the racist process. And, you know, the way Asians and black people and uh, brown people and American natives experience this awful thing is always different. And I think American natives get treated with so little respect that they turn their image turns into like the fabric of our country and we use them as sports team names we use them as butter logos we use them as like tobacco logos and i think when you're when the the imagery is changed when someone even changes a sports team logo people flip out and whatever political correctness is in 2020 I don't even think it's a thing we should just like stop talking about it but it offends people as kind of a rights issue and it's a way to own the libs being like you guys are so sensitive we can't even use a racial identity as a costume for butter and I don't care get rid of it you know it's not up to us it's up to the people who are depicted and if one person doesn't like it uh, okay that's fine like i don't need an american native on my butter it's a nice idea like this goes there's a tradition of butter and it comes from the land and these are virtuous people and i like that idea but if it's outdated get rid of it as you said this is about symbols it's not actually about an image of a Native American woman. That no one cares about that. No one cares about buying butter that has that logo on it. And I will say, it was a good logo as far as logos go. It was one of the great logos. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. So I get it from a design aesthetic, but I don't think that's what we're talking about here. No. We're talking about the idea that voices, as you mentioned, Native American voices somehow were able to shift a company's opinion in a way that then made white males overall subjected to that opinion. It made them hear about it and it affected their lives in the slightest bit. That's what we're talking about here. The rage against someone's lives being adjacently incrementally affected by someone else's opinion and someone else's belief system and someone else being offended by a logo. That's what we're talking about. That a sliver, a sliver of even noticing it drove people up the wall. Yeah, and when you're looking for that stuff, I think of like the $20 bill thing. Like we went through a whole process to put Harriet Tubman on there. I thought that was pretty cool. We went through the process and Trump was like, not on my watch. I'm like, oh, I didn't know you cared about this. 
but obviously you do. But I don't. I'm sorry, that looks a lot like a black woman on a U.S. dollar. <laughs> That's going to be a no for me, dog. <laughs> it's a hard no. Like we could. Oh just no, done def- <laughs> definitely not. No, 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 no. Andrew Jackson. <laughs> but I mean, and you know, I try to think about everything. Comes back to the professional National Football League team that represents the District of Columbia, whose name is. Like not a not a great name. I think they should have corrected that decades ago. <laughs> not a great name is what you're going with. <laughs> it's not a name I even want to say out of I was my like, mouth. I was like, you won't say it out loud. You're like, it's not the best name. It's not ideal. No. I won't say it. But I have friends from the D.C. area who love that team who say the name. And I'm like, it's fine. You know, like this is like a cultural thing. And they're like, oh, my God, is that OK? I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm like, do it, man. Like it, that's what your team has been called your whole life. But, you know, Snyder, who owns that team, is, you know, steadfast in his uh, opinion that it's like we're too sensitive. And this is this is a thing that's a fabric of not only that area of the country, but America, and to change it would just be un-American or, and he owns the team, so he can do whatever he wants. And all of which is true. I'm like, that's true, but you're still a jerk. It doesn't make you a jerk, you know? It's like, I could, free speech, I could say these awful things. I'm like, that is correct. I don't like you at all, you know? And it's like a mix of these two things and there's no action to be taken, and when action is taken, it upsets. It has to upset somebody. It is a testament to the genocide of Native Americans that they have such a small voice that they, they can't even to... get the name Redskins, a slur stricken from an NFL team. If they were any other group, I think it would have been effective. Yeah, but their experience is tough, man. There are so few of them, and they are so deeply impoverished. And this is all by design, of course. Oh and my God, subjected yeah. to so many cruelties that their voice is this little whisper that is almost just neglected. There is no mainstream Native American voice like that I can think of. I'm not saying there aren't people who have become you know, members of the media or writers, etc., but as a group... There is no voice other than this sort of, okay, it's time to write an article about the Land O'Lakes butter. Let's go find somebody. And who do we have here? Okay, um, we have like someone from a tribe to say a statement saying, finally, some changes. Yeah. That's it. That's the yeah. only voice they have. Yeah, and it's, and it is crazy. It is crazy that we do the tomahawk chop. It is crazy that there is a name of a team, the Redskins. It's freaking crazy. It just doesn't feel, yeah, I I understand it only because I grew up watching the Atlanta Braves and the Tomahawk Chop, but like somewhere along in the 90s, we realized that was a really bad thing and we changed, you know? And it's like, I'm not Oriental, I'm Asian. I'm like, well, I'm both, but the language has changed. So yeah, now I'm Asian and you can't say Oriental. and with the American Native thing, it got me thinking like this White House is obsessed with that wall. And I'm like, this stupid border that is this arbitrary line, which almost feels like sports, but like Mexican, the Mexican country is like American Native. And we have just been shitting on these people for so long that it's just like infuriating. <laughs> like they're not mentioned enough and um, it's too hard. And even small things like making gambling legal and making gambling legal in all these states, I'm like, uh, we're just like so cruel to every step of the way with uh, American natives. And the Land o Lakes thing, I feel like you're right, can only happen with certain races and they they finally had a voice and people some some a few people don't like it it might just be like a hundred people on social media because i don't think people actually give a fuck no i don't i don't think people actually care at all yeah it's just a few people um it's good butter i'm still gonna buy it it was a great great american logo but it's gone are you are you a land of lakes man 
No, I've been buying like bougie local butter. Mm. It makes such a difference, man. Or I buy the Irish butter that costs like three or four dollars that comes in a, a block. Um, I, a good butter is like worth the extra dollar, man. What do you think about Breakstone Hotel Butter? I don't know it. I think that's School what it's me. called, right? School I me. I think it's fine. It's just like the other brand. It's the one that comes in oh. red and blue for salted and unsalted. Uh, absolutely right. Okay, I grew up on that stuff. Uh, the whipped version that comes in the round container with the cap. Mm. Um, I I don't buy it anymore because again I've become a bougie butter guy. Like the grass fed butter is incredible. It is better. I don't use butter in cooking that much though. So what? Maybe I'll have to step up and be a better butter boy. Be the better. Be the best butter boy you can be. Ben. <laughs> But no, I I've been putting butter in my Asian stir fry. It it's great. Um, wow, I use you it were you were gonna get slammed on the group chat when I divulged that you've been befouling traditional dishes with butter. So we're on a group chat with a bunch of Asian Alliance heads that we all love quite a bit, but they are cooking cops, man. <laughs> They have rules like you wouldn't believe. They are the Michael Jordan documentary snitching ass park uh, park photo professionals. Hmm. Um, they do not enjoy um, veering from tradition at all. You are in trouble. I'm I'm snitching. Um, well, anyway, I'm going to try to be a better butter boy. I'm going to get some enhanced butters, expensive butters. As Quo said, be cool. <laughs> be cool. Trust, try, just try the grass-fed butter, man. <laughs> chill out. Chill out and have some butter. Um, okay, I'm into that. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're 40 minutes in. It's time I think for it's, some hoops. I think it's time to talk about The Last Dance. <laughs> what? That amazing documentary on ESPN that just completed its fourth hour about your god, Michael Jordan. Uh, As you're slamming the keyboard, what are you looking up, sire? Okay, so we just got episodes three and four from ESPN's Michael Jordan hagiography, The Last Dance. And this was, I guess, the Dennis Rodman episode, maybe? (laughs) Allegedly. Allegedly, sort of. And then four was about vanquishing the brutal Pistons. Those were the two new episodes that aired Sunday on ESPN. Public Enemy number one, Isaiah Thomas one. As two ethical <laughs> viewers who have not gone ahead and watched the entire series after its leak, or at least the first seven episodes, I guess that's what's floating around. Because I want to watch this in, in real time along with the basketball community. This, the documentary is starting to take shape. Tonally, and the perspective, the We're the point of view. Of the way through. We kind of know now what the documentary is like. Do you have any 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 thoughts about how it is unfolding? It is a damn dumpster fire of a Trump rally, man. It has <laughs> it has one point of view, and that point of view is the same point of view we've been hearing since the Jordan era was in real time. So what makes a good documentary? It's like tension, conflict, drama, uh, new information, a voice that maybe we haven't heard before. Um, why was Tiger King successful? It's because we got to know and kind of love and hate certain characters. Does The Last Dance have any of this? No. It is just like, I was great when I did that, and I was even better when I did that, and none of it's my fault. I take no responsibility for any of it. I don't want to um, allege that Michael Jordan has final say over this doc because I have no idea. We do know that he agreed to be part of it after LeBron James beat the Golden State Warriors and brought a title to Cleveland. That that spurred Michael Jordan's existential crisis about his legacy and said, all right, I'm down. Let's do this doc about 1998 championship. 
Does he have final say? I don't know. Does it feel as if it is made for a viewership of one? Yes. (laughs) It absolutely feels like this was a project that someone made for Michael Jordan to watch and say, hell yeah, man, that's exactly how it went down. He (laughs) is the narrator. He is the arbiter of truth. He is the compass for this entire 10 hours. And it's someone who has a vested interest in telling this story in one way. And I think that is a problem and why it's actually far less effective because yes, right. as, as you just said, this is my understanding of all these events as it was told to me by everyone who wanted to elevate Michael Jordan forever. This is everything that we knew, you know, we are old as dirt. We remember when the Pistons beat the Bulls. We remember when Jordan and the Bulls finally beat the Pistons. We remember when he won his first championship. This stuff all happened. We remember when Pippen had a migraine. These are all parts of of the fossil record of the NBA before it existed with Allen Iverson and the pre-NBA ecosystem. But we remember all this shit. We know what happened. Mm-hmm. So for it to be regurgitated exactly the same way yeah. 20, 30 years later doesn't seem like it's doing anything except for beating us in the head with the story we were told. And let's, okay, let's start with the small. Let's look at the small parts of it. We were promised episode three as the, the Rodman episode. People are like, it's incredible. It goes into Dennis Rodman and the bad boys. And I'm like, fascinating topic i could watch a a 10 hour standalone documentary about just that because i thought it was going to be about depression race mental health uh, the idea of subculture within a broader culture the nba and rodman i thought it was going to be about a changing of the paradigm of the individual over the team i thought it was going to be about detroit and gentrification in Chicago and these two poor cities that were struggling at that time. This is all stuff that like I would like to have discussed. We got none of that, man. <laughs> we barely got the details of when Rodman like disappeared. We barely got that story. The biggest thing for me is that it just feels like Jordan's version of this. And It was a bad idea to do it in that way because what makes Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali or makes Allen Iverson Allen Iverson or any iconic figure interesting is the story. And when Michael Jordan's story is only he was great. I knew it when he was 14. He won a college championship. Then he just kept winning. It took him a little while, but then he won. He made everyone around him better. So they won. And everything is just about victory. It's deeply, deeply boring. It actually trivializes the idea of victory because he wins so much. Why are we supposed to care about him winning in 1998? It's the last dance. Oh, you mean he needs to win a sixth championship after winning a college championship? Who cares? Who cares? Why is he so driven? Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. Why does he care? Right. What is this competitiveness? Who gives a fuck about winning a sixth championship? Who cares? But why? What, why was he deeply frustrated and mad all the time until they won a championship where he cries? Why can't we look inside and try to figure out what was wrong with him? Yeah. Why was he this, this like, asshole? Yeah. yeah. What, what was yeah. his problem? That, that, to me, is kind of fascinating. But also, bigger picture, as you mentioned, these cities they're in, in the 90s? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like Chicago, Cabrini Green Projects, Gangster Disciples, Vice Lords, like People Nation, Folk Nation. It was a crime epidemic. It was a gang epidemic. People were getting killed for bull starter jackets. People were getting killed for Air Jordan sneakers. Like from the New York Times, here's a little quote. In Chicago and other cities, including Detroit, New York, these are all the rivals, and Los Angeles, who they played, Such incidents not only underscore the degree to which street crime and violence are now endemic to life in the inner city, but also serve as a perverse measure of the hottest local fashion trend. That's interesting. That is interesting. Like, 
what do we know about Jordan already this? What what do we want to hear from his mouth? Like, I want to hear the Republican. I want to hear him talk about that quote that has allegedly been misquoted for decades about how Republicans also buy his sneakers. I want him just to be like, I never said that, or I did say that. These are all things. I want him to talk about his father a little bit. He doesn't have to disclose. I, I think they get to that. I've heard that's episode yeah. six. I mean, that's going to be great, I hope. But um, I want him... So I think about the most successful uh, TV things that we have, and I, th- I thought about Lost quite a bit because you're you're introduced to all these characters at the same time. If you're watching The Last Dance uh, uh, with Cold, uh, Cold, and Lost was successful because you were given characters that you didn't know, and then you were you see them in a stressful situation but then in that first season they go into each character's background and you get to build up tension that way and each character has different motivations we are not getting like if you don't know basketball you may not know what horace grant meant to this team and we're not getting that we got a john paxson moment but who was john paxson who was craig elo who was scotty pippen other than a guy that Jordan throws under the bus over and over for four hours. Like, we don't have enough buildup for uh, this tension. So when he wins his first championship within the first hour, four hours of this documentary, we don't really care that much, right? Well, when Michael Jordan is the Polaris, the North Star of everything else in this universe, we can only look at Pippen through the prism of his utility for Michael Jordan. He came along. He was good. That was the best team I'd ever had. He was soft. I don't know if he really had a migraine. Oh, then he became good. Oh, yeah. Then we were able to beat the Pistons. Thank you, Scottie Pippen, for helping Michael Jordan to become even better, to win that first championship. Thanks, dude. Horace Grant, B.J. Armstrong. These guys were the reason that the Bulls went from being a good team that won 50-some games to winning 63 But in the context of this documentary, it's just that Jordan started lifting weights and led by example, and then the whole team became better. That's not what happened. What happened was the Chicago Bulls went from being a good team to the best team in the NBA, winning 63 games, having the number one offensive rating, and having an elite defense at number seven, whereas the prior season, it was ranked 19th. They became an elite defensive team along with having the best offense in basketball. And Scottie Pippen went from being a good player to a superstar. That's what happened. It wasn't Jordan lifted weights and led by example. Like, come on. Come on. Do better than that bullshit. Because that's what we heard at the time. You have the gift of 30 years of hindsight. You have the gift of stats. You have the gift of footage. You have the gift of being able to interview anyone. And what you came up with was the exact same thing we were told on Inside Stuff by Ahmad Rashad. (laughs) He got bigger, man. He he took no days off like me. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, there was moments where like it was, you know, waiting for this footage that is going to blow our minds. And so far, it's just like Rodman signing autographs, which is sweet to see. But just game footage. And then we see the airplane and there's a quick panning shot of Tony Kukoc. I'm like, there's Tony Kukoc. There's a whole hour about him in there can we hear about him and i think we'll get that too i think we'll get ku coach i'm i'm hoping i'm hoping but we're already two-fifths of the way in man i mean i mean we're gonna have to get a lot in at this point uh because i want to hear about nike i want to hear about the city of chicago where is the chicago house music dude like that would have made this documentary even a little bit better But when you said, let's talk about the little stuff. Okay, so Michael Jordan suggests that Scottie Pippen didn't actually have a migraine. We just heard Pippen say, I was blind. I couldn't see. I was out there. I was literally blind. Okay, that could be whatever the case. Jordan says, he says, he says he had a migraine, says that. Well, where's the follow-up? Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. Horace Grant lost his cool. That's why we lost. I'm like, can you talk to Horace now? Like, are, are we doing this? <laughs> My thing is, okay, so Mike, you just suggested that one of the greatest players of all time is lying about having a migraine? Huge. If, if that's the case, why? Yeah. 
And let's then get into that because, you know, Mike Wilbon writing about it at the time, you know, he said, or afterwards talking about Scottie Pippen, that there was questions about Scottie Pippen. This was, he wrote after that, but a few years later, like in the nineties, mid nineties in 1990 in game seven of the conference finals against the Pistons, when what he called a migraine headache, a migraine headache impaired his vision, he turned to jello and Michael Jordan had to basically go it alone unsuccessfully. That was the perception that Pippen was faking it, that Pippen was lying. Why not get more into that? What did that mean to Scottie Pippen? We hear his explanation. We hear Michael Jordan basically shrug at it, and then we don't go back to Pippen. Mm -hmm. Pippen, people said you were lying. People said you were soft. Did you ever have another migraine again like that? If it wasn't a migraine, what was it? We are now at the place where you have guys like DeMar DeRozan and Kevin Love acknowledging that they've had panic attacks and have had depression. Scotty, what's up? Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying here is that if they got a little more into these unseemly elements and challenged the conventional wisdom a bit, I think it could be a really compelling documentary. There are certainly very interesting subjects. Yeah, and I was really fascinated by Isaiah Thomas. I, you don't wake up thinking you're going to stand for Isaiah Thomas, number one, but here I am. I thought his take about culture was so interesting, about how he's like, we get criticized for not shaking hands with Michael Jordan because of Michael Jordan, but Larry Bird does this on the regular. Like, we do this. Do you see me interacting with Kevin McHale and challenging him and then going through the cameras caught their discussion and then you know they came to a, a a middle ground and jordan just being like he's an asshole i'm like what don't you like about him don't you aren't you the guy who is a sociopath winner and isaiah thomas taking a loss hard isn't that what you cultivate and i wanted to know more about how isaiah was describing it's the almost as if he was isaiah was hinting at there being a a, a media force (laughs) that drove discussion about the Pistons' disrespect for the game by walking off against the Bulls and somehow ignored the Boston Celtics doing the exact same thing a few years earlier against the Pistons. Like, I don't know what sort of media, (laughs) you know, uh, organization, (laughs) how you'd phrase it, uh... Uh, a cabal, a, a, a <laughs> La Cosa Nostra, uh, a Bean a Town, Bur- something, <laughs> a, a, a group of a, a green hand, a little green hand. It's like a, a pastrami posse with <laughs> tiny green hands. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I was surprised to see Isaiah with that split second stating his case. But it just built up eventually for Jordan to rip him down, and be like, "Oh, he's an asshole," and I'm like. Can we talk more about that? Like, why do you hate him? And I hope we get into Team USA, but we might not because this very much seems like a Michael Jordan uh, hype reel, right? Michael Jordan was viewed by a lot of people as being a stat hog. Yeah. He was criticized a lot, and I don't think it was fair. But they don't really get into the criticism as much as they get into Jordan had to learn to trust his teammates or rather they had to earn his trust and then he trusted them and like let Scottie Pippen bring the ball up or let John Paxson who was like first in the NBA in three point percentage that year or something take a game winning three. It was all like they earned the trust and it's about Jordan. It's not about John Paxson hitting that shot. It's about Jordan letting John Paxson hit that shot. Everything is the prism of MJ. And chasing hypocrisy is pointless, but this is what people criticize LeBron James for doing, right? Going to the best shot and the best shooter in crunch time. And Jordan, when Jordan does it, he's trusting his teammates. And when LeBron does it, he doesn't have a killer instinct. Whatever. It's, it's, hypocrisy is boring. But, but, again, but again, we didn't get into MJ being a ball hog. Yeah. I'm not even saying that was a, a good criticism or a fair one. But like, if you had added those edges to this documentary... And you'd be like, Michael Jordan is a fucking ball hog. Like, oh, that would have been shit. interesting. Yeah. Oh, shit. Was he? Maybe he was. Like, get into that. Maybe well, he, he was a ball hog. 
you know, maybe he was a bad teammate. Like, get into it. And he mentioned that briefly, but it moves too quickly, even within 10 hours, because they mentioned Tex Winter and the, the triangle offense. And Jordan was like, I don't want to move the ball. I have the ball in my hands. Isn't that where you want the ball to be? I'm like, go on. And it just moves. And then we kept on winning. It's like, ugh. I know, and that's that's what bums me out is that every every anecdote, every little twist ends with, and then we won. Yeah. yeah. So Dennis Rodman, he messed up. So he came to my hotel room, and he smoked a cigar. He didn't apologize, but I knew he was apologizing. And after yeah. that, we started winning. So you know, wins, win victories. They started coming in. So you know, that's the end of that story. Yeah. <laughs> I also have a running. Uh, idea that like this documentary doesn't do justice for anybody because we have to see actual footage and there was that one small scene where it's like Jordan couldn't cover magic because he magic was too big or Jordan didn't want it enough but anyway uh, and we had to switch Pippen onto him and Pippen shut the greatest point guard of our era down and they showed the footage and magic is like backing up from 30 feet dribbling (laughs) with one hand looking every direction as everyone just stares at him i'm like this is terrible basketball man run a screen out there (laughs) run a screen like pippin moving his feet shouldn't stop a dribbler like i mean to be fair magic is a power forward being guarded by a small (laughs) forward like it's tough going against smaller guys who are who are quicker than you, you know, as a big man. Right, right. right. I mean, for real. Like, that's the funniest thing about it. Like, you know, Magic Johnson was this point guard. and like, Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the smaller guy was able to somehow confound the slower, larger point guard. Well, Pippen, they switched Pippen onto him, and that's when it gave him problems because Pippen was as big. Yeah. And, like, I mean, this is all the small stuff that drives me nuts because – you know, maybe uh, to be realistic, like 10 hours is not enough. It should be 20 hours, you know, because I don't know how they're going to cram all this stuff in. And that's a testament to Michael Jordan and the Bulls. There is so much complicated. There's so much complication here that I don't know how you don't Ken Burns, New York City, this shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't want to sound as if I'm, I'm like, you know, trashing the stock. I think there's a lot no, of... We, it, well, it's more that I just wish it was a different doc. I think it's a fascinating subject. I think you have great highlights. You've got some pretty good archival footage. And it's just that it repeats exactly the conventional wisdom from the time. And, like, that's deeply, deeply uninteresting to me. You know, this sport has evolved. A lot of time has gone by. We should be able to use the gift of hindsight to reassess certain things. And I think one of the biggest issues with it is that there's no one who we hear from who isn't currently in their 50s. No one, not one person, not one person. Every single person that we have spoken to, member of the media, coach, former player, every single person is in their 50s. Well, Carmelo Anthony makes an appearance. But But was that just like a promo, right? Oh, was that a promo? It wasn't even in the actual doc? I think it's a promo. I think okay. they've been do- they, they stitched in a yeah. few promos from when they come back from commercials. Like LeBron James has to be in this at some point, right? He is the pivotal voice that we need. And he's going to be like, if he is even in it, he's going to be like, hats off to LeBron. I mean, hats off to Jordan. He is the greatest. I'll concede that. Maybe. I don't know. But he's the one I want to see on my screen, right? I just feel like if everyone is in their 50s, and they're regurgitating what they said at the time. You know, shout out to David Aldridge, legendary basketball journalist. He's 55 years old. He was the one writing these stories and covering this Bulls team. Of course, he should be part of this documentary. But he also has a vested interest in protecting the Bulls and their legacy the same way that players do, th- that Michael Jordan does, the same way that everyone yeah. involved does. And when you ask, BJ Armstrong, he might have a different opinion about things, but he's still 52 years old. Yeah. There is no one in this to say, well, with the gift of hindsight, there's a difference now. We saw how the game evolved and what Scottie Pippen did. We get a reference. He kind of invented the point forward position. Get into that. 
Yes. Yeah. Talk about that. Talk about how the game shifted. Talk about how Pippen as a versatile wing is relevant today. Talk about Andre Iguodala. Talk about the, you know, talk about the advances of the game. Otherwise, like, it's just trapped in amber. Yeah, it's in between, right? Like, the greatest sports thing I've ever seen was, I think, that Douglas Gordon Zidane a movie where he just has, like, seven cameras on him with no sound during a game. It's beautiful, but it's the extreme of the minutia of the way to make this incredible uh, a story. And then another way to do it is to be macrocosmic right like they should jump into the future and the past like there's no mention of bill russell or andre Iguodala, but like there could be there's ways to do this and when you look at personnel the producers michael jordan maybe the espn's great they have they've made beautiful things the music editor maybe not really he's clearly from new york um the editor's not great like the cinematographer isn't great like None of it's quite adding up to something memorable. I just feel like if it was in the hands of someone like Ezra Edelman, the mix of race and class and the 90s and the interesting characters that we have, MJ, sociopath, Pippin may have been mentally weak. I I don't know. I'm just saying for the sake of a, a character. Dennis Rodman, a fascinating person. Yes. Phil Jackson, interesting. But like, People need to be called on their bullshit. In it order can't just for, right. be MJ gets to say, here's how it went down. And you're like, thanks, MJ. You clarified it. Yeah. I mean, I think about the my favorite documentaries and like they usually are Errol Morris documentaries. And the reason why they're so good is not only is he a great storyteller and he knows rhythm and uh, and timing and and drama, but he has like wonderful music and it's sometimes philip glass and he to your point he challenges the the subject and i think of the fog of war and mcnamara he really challenged him and to a point where mcnamara was like you lost me i'm doubling over my thoughts i'm confused and it was like really gripping stuff to watch this person kind of like recount his life looking back and 30 years has been a long time since the bulls there has to be some of this, right? Some sort of reflection after all this time has gone by. I never feel for one second that MJ is reflecting. Yeah. Not one bit. It's MJ being deeply protective of his legacy, telling this story the way he feels like telling it, chuckling at his own boring anecdotes, yeah. and everything is through the, the filter of winning. <laughs> no. There's no, no one is ever challenged. No one ever looks uncomfortable on camera. Yeah. Um, I have no problem with celebrities being narcissists. Like, I, are, not all narcissists are created equal, I guess. But I have yet to see Jordan this, this forward with it. He is someone who is singularly concerned with his legacy and his point of view. And that's all we're getting. And to be frank, if the holdup on this doc was MJ's involvement and this is what you got from him? Why did you bother? Yeah. Yeah. What well, this you got MJ doing what? Yeah. Just I mean, saying he's the greatest? If you're gonna do that, then let him rant. Yeah. Make him make him uncomfortable. Yeah. I think we're getting two things confounded though. This is not meant to be art or journalism. No. This this no. was meant to be propaganda, right? Yes. The problem is it's propaganda with cursing, so it becomes art. <laughs> oh, they're cursing in it like this is real. This is the real I, deal. They Isaiah said, was they, an they asshole. dropped F bombs. Yeah. I agree. Like it it is clear to I thought it, within ten years we were gonna get some sort of like uh layering, but so far, two fifths of the way in, um, not so much. And I think we're just gonna be this is like a the order part of law and order. And this is where the the defense states its case against LeBron James. Well, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's exactly what that is. It's, and I think it's less effective as a propaganda tool because it feels like propaganda. Mm-hmm. When you say they became good because Jordan led by example, like, get out of here. 
doesn't even or, pass doesn't pass the sniff test. I'm an adult. Or show man. me or show, convince me, right? I'm an adult. Yeah. You saying that MJ lifting weights and everyone else started <laughs> lifting weights and all of a sudden they became good? Prove it. Prove it. Because yeah. you just saying it, that that sounds like bullshit to me. Right. You know, right. making Jordan vulnerable. He couldn't do it without them. Couldn't do it. He could not do it. They didn't even say that the Bulls became the best team in the NBA, and that's why they beat the Pistons. They were just a lot better than the Pistons that year. Yeah. They smacked the shit out of them. Yeah. They swept them in the playoffs. Yeah. Pippen fouled hard in game four of a four-game sweep. Then I knew <laughs> he was tough enough to play aside me, Michael Jordan. Can we have a running checklist of how many – of his peers, Jordan snitches on. Because we're getting to almost all of them. Horace was too soft, but somehow I Jordan overcame it. Pippen was too soft, but somehow Jordan overcame it. Um, Jerry Krause was ugly, but somehow Jordan overcame it. <laughs> he was short and fat, but Jordan somehow overcame it. <laughs> right. It's like uh, Isaiah Thomas, asshole. But Jordan beat him, so erased <laughs> from history. Uh, Dennis Rodman didn't want it enough, but through the tutelage of Jordan's cigar, <laughs> overcame. Like, this is just some bullshit, isn't it's it? It's bullshit. Every <laughs> single thing is Jordan wanted it more, taught other people how to want it more, and in return, victory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I don't want it to sound too sour because we love this, right? Like, me and you are just like, this is fun stuff. This is stuff to talk about. This is great. But um, we're getting to the point where we can criticize this thing as a thing, and it has holes in it, man. I mean, look, if you are the person from ESPN who made this and you're listening to us going off <laughs> about your doc, it's because it works. We are also yeah. Yeah. we are also people who are deeply skeptical of MJ to begin with yes. and the mythos of MJ. So when we're criticizing the craft and the perspective and, and the voices and all that stuff, it's because our perspective does run counter to exactly what this documentary is propagating. Right. This is catnip for us to attack. Yes. So yes. like no disrespect. Good work. You made a 10 hour doc about the bulls. It just happens to be propaganda against my ethos and Andrew Quo's ethos. 100. Yes, and uh, it got me to thinking, like, can the other 28 teams in the NBA <laughs> do this exact thing? Like, The Last Dance, a documentary about the last time we won, and make it flowery in the same way, because there's not much heavy lifting, no pun intended, here. Like, this is very simple documentary, basic stuff. Like, the Warriors could crush this style documentary. LeBron James is going to own this in 10 years, you know? And I think... Because we saw, collectively, more recently, LeBron James become a villain. And everyone hate him, Lit Choker. Gratefully. He's so generous that and, way. And that was, you know, within the last 15 years. We are cognizant of it. We live through it in real time. We don't need to be reminded of the insults and the beef and the arguments and all that kind of shit. Jordan was long enough ago that... If you are, say, 30 years old or younger, you are probably watching this without the same gimlet eye as a pair of long-toothed basketball fans like us. You are looking to this to tell you the story. Mm -hmm. And you aren't getting the whole story. You're getting Michael Jordan's perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the, the Jordan Twitter out there is of like people who live through it, man. <laughs> They're just like sports bloggers in their 40s and 50s. And uh, I, I don't think like this is a convincing argument for a, a young sneakerhead because, you know, the Jordan brand exists, I think, relatively independently of Jordan as a player. And you can love his shoes and not really know about him and the ins and outs of his uh, championship years. But it's, it's LeBron James country, and we can push back against it, but it's just a matter of time before. Uh, it's just, it, it feels futile to me because this seems just like a cycle. And, uh, you know, the BMM, they have a whole media empire based around Tommy Heinsohn. 
Like this was this is just like a simulation, and we're gonna go through this with LeBron and probably hopefully Zion Williamson. Right, I think this could have been done in a way that would pass the sniff test, and to me, it doesn't because they don't tell you why Jordan was so good. They only tell you stuff that sounds like cliche the minute it comes out of everyone's mouth because he wanted it more and because he won. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything to me, dude. Tell me. Tell me how Jordan was so different. Tell me why he was unguardable. Tell me what he could do on the court. Tell me more about what it was like to try to guard him. I think they did like one quote about that. You know, I I remember like literally like one thing from like Sidney Moncrief being like, damn, he looks, he looks hard to check. I think like John Sally has been the best person in this because he's funny and he actually kind of seems to talk with a, with some perspective. Yeah. I'm interested. Yeah. He's great. Uh, Let's, we're not going to get the race discussion, right? Like we're not going to get uh, a framing of the city of Chicago. We're, we're, we're getting the minutia only, aren't we? We're just getting wanting it more in a victory. Yeah, I mean, is I mean Dennis Rodman barely got airtime in his own episode. How much are we going to talk about Tony Kukoc? Where is the Cliff Levingston episode? <laughs> but well, look, look, yeah. I think there is stuff that I I enjoy this. To be clear, I like watching this documentary. I like seeing all these guys. I like seeing the footage of them on the plane with Jordan snitching on Scott Burrell. Like, that shit's funny. I want more of that. I yeah, like. I yes. enjoy that. I like watching Jordan dunking over people. It's crazy. Yo, know, he had springs and really long arms. Like, he yammed on people. It yeah. does look like he's flying. That shit is yeah. really cool. Into it. But, like, it's not challenging anyone. Yeah. And... Yeah, and your point is correct. Like, we, me and you, are disposed to, it's like, challenge us. I mean, we love to talk about race, and we love to talk about music, and those things aren't coming through in this documentary, and that's our taste. But I think that creates a, a broader picture of how great Michael Jordan was as a top six player yes. of all time. Well, make, and, make the case that he is a top ten player. Argue yeah. it against me. Yes. Just saying he's great. I'm like, you know who else is great? Terrell Brandon. <laughs> right. Tim Hardaway Jr., great player. Okay, why? He's great. Yeah. MSG counters with Jeremy Lin week. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> and um, we are going to put up a few more posts for the Lin-centric cookies teas. There are some left uh-huh. for Knicks-related, Lakers-related, maybe a special something coming at the end of Lin week. If you've made it an hour and 15 through this pod, a little heads up. <laughs> But uh, yeah, those are still available. Let's let's post them up a few times for Lin Week. Um, moving on to contemporary basketball, but also Chicago. Uh, Mark Eversley, who is an executive with the Sixers, his exact title eludes me. They all were given new titles after Colangelo's departure. Assistant to the GM. It was all things like that. Executive. <laughs> Steve Mills' ass employee. <laughs> so he's been hired by the Chicago Bulls as an executive in wow. their front office. Big Bulls week, man. Woo! A strange hire, as far as I can tell. A member of the Calangeli, uh, as the as the resident Sixers expert. What's your take? My take is that this is just based on my perception and things that I've heard. So it's not based on published reports. I'm not gleaning information. It's just shit that I heard was that Mark Eversley was kind of the man out in the Sixers organization. He was Colangelo's guy in Toronto. He then worked for the Wizards and then he was brought in under Colangelo as like his buddy in the front office. And then all these NBA guys came in and they were assigned other powerful positions. And from what I've heard, those are the guys, Alex Rucker, Scott O'Neill, um, Ned Cohen, they're the guys who run the team. And Eversley has been kind of like the fourth wheel, fifth wheel, whatever, as like the vestigial Colangelo ally in that front office. So considering that Brian Colangelo supposedly interviewed with the Chicago Bulls for their general manager spot before it was 
um, uh, before they hired your boy from the Denver Nuggets with a long and confusing last name. My boy. Before they did that move, they brought in Colangelo for an interview. And there is a relationship between Jerry Colangelo and Jerry Reinsdorf that goes back decades, 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 back to this era of Michael Jordan, etc. So them hiring Brian Colangelo's buddy for an executive job in Chicago seems like a homie move. I'm not going to hire your son, but I will hire his best buddy. He'll have kind of like an ear in the organization, I guess. But like, he's not happy in Philly. He doesn't have any power in Philly. He's not making decisions. He's been kind of out, ousted from the inner circle. I'll give him a new NBA executive job as like a solid. That's what it seems like to me. And this is not to say that Mark Eversley is not good at his job. I don't know what he does. But from my understanding, he wasn't really doing anything in Philly for the last two years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's hard to tell what he did and what his resume looks like. But he's going to be in a significant um, role. In, in Chicago and there's moves to be made there they have assets he has that's a pretty good job right I, I don't know what he'll do there isn't he GM no oh. oh I mean I'm not sure what his title is there but I mean we know who's making the decisions right right um, yeah is this is a nothing burger story maybe mm -hmm. I, I would say him being the GM yeah, he's going to technically be the GM. So it is a powerful position. Yeah, they've got some pieces. He's got a decision to make with Dunn. But he's not making decisions, though. Mm-hmm. You know, like they hired the person who's making decisions. Sure, sure. Is he the meat shield? I mean, every team, every big market team needs one now, right? Um, he could be. I mean, he's not a big name. Uh, he has protection, like you said. He's part of the inner circle of the NBA, so he is a a made man kind of ish. But like, um, I don't know. I don't know how these front offices shake out. I like positionless basketball. I like positionless front offices. I don't think that it will make any difference for Philly because I don't think he's had a lot of say so. And to reiterate. It's not something I know factually, just based on people that I've spoken with. Mm -hmm. I think he's been sort of sitting there since Colangelo left. You know, they are seemingly still in contact. He still has, has close ties to them as like friends and, and professionally, et cetera. But with Jerry and Brian both out of the Philly organization, it's now being run by a different group of people. And hey, look. Maybe he has better ideas than what the Philly guys have been doing. Maybe he'll be great. I don't know what his worldview is. If he was advising Brian Colangelo during his tenure in Philadelphia, then his ideas were not good or were not heeded because they made really poor decisions. But maybe he'll be good in Chicago. I don't, I don't know anything about his worldview. I don't think I've ever seen him do an interview. You can find old clips of him and Brian Colangelo from the Toronto days with him having Colangelo's ear and seeming to be kind of the guy who does stuff. So maybe, yeah. he's, maybe he's a great executive who was just buried on the bench in Philly. Yeah. yeah, it's not a super creative hire, but it's also not a, a very predictable one. So I'm, I'm interested to see. I'm, I'm surprised, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, right? Like, it doesn't come to mind first as a GM guy, but... I don't know. We're in a new era of GM where it's like not always Elton Brand or an ex player, you know, or Doug Collins or Herb Williams. So I'm I'm excited to see. I got I got no more love for the Bulls now after this documentary than I did before. So whatever. Well, we've talked about these sort of different models of GMs, right? Mm -hmm. And some teams like oh, I want the lineage of the Mori's, mm -hmm. the Mori. <laughs> where they're analytics driven and asset management, depressed assets, that kind of thing. And then there's the teams who want a mega agent because they're in a big market. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the new list of coaches who are potentially up in the running for the Nets position. And Oof. it's very Nixian. 
Yeah, you got your boy Jason Kidd is up for another head coaching job. <laughs> Not surprising. Um, who else is up? I'm surprised Chauncey Billups is in there, but Ty Lue. It's all the same there. guys. It's Mark Jackson. It's Jeff Van Gundy. It's the Knicks list. That's right. Uh, I still I still think Van Gundy is an interesting coach because we get to hear his brain in action during games, and I'm a I'm a big fan. So I think he is a get for any team, but. All these like does Mark Jackson matter? Does Jason Kidd matter? Like, do coaches matter? I don't know. Also, it's only about who gets along with DeAndre Jordan, apparently, because <laughs> none of those guys are better coaches than Kenny Atkinson. None of them. Yeah, Van, Van Gundy is a good coach. Mark Jackson maybe, but they haven't coached in years. In Kenny years. Atkinson was a an excellent coach. He was yeah. a modern coach. He understood modern basketball. He was a player's coach. He There's just, more to that story than DeAndre. you got to think, right? It, DeAndre think, has too much power here. Well, I, I know. I think it's DeAndre and his, and his friends. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just saying, friends. when you yeah. get rid of Kenny Atkinson and you say your new list is these guys, well, all right, great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't quite get it. To your point, like they had everything rolling. And then they brought in a disgruntled, aging, not even superstar, just star. Guy. And, yeah. And he changes up the whole script. And that is a really dangerous proposition. It sure is. It <laughs> sure is. Well, speaking of dangerous propositions, uh, maybe, we'll record, maybe we'll record more this week. Who knows? Yeah. Who can say? Yeah. It's hard to say, you know, like we wanted it more, but even Jordan took a year off. Uh, Michael Jordan took a year off. Uh, our buddy is currently on vacation. Maybe we'll be back. I don't know. It's all in the air. <laughs> Cookies. Cookies.